In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness moved upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living soul. Is this how God created mankind? Welcome to Great Scientists. Tonight I'm going to be talking about Charles Darwin. Now, Charles Darwin was a natural history scientist, an observer of nature, a man who came up with one of the most controversial theories in the history of science. But even today, there are people who would claim that Charles Darwin was a mistaken and a dangerous man. What is it about Darwin's ideas that people find so fascinating and provocative? Well, first, we need to remind ourselves how people viewed the world before he proposed his famous theory of evolution. For over 2,000 years, scientific theory on the nature of life was based on the ideas of the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle, who concluded from his observations of animals that species do not change. So when Darwin first suggested that over millions of years life had evolved and adapted, and indeed that it was still doing so, a lot of people thought it an absurd suggestion. And if you then put that together with the idea that we might be related to the apes, well, you have a theory that even now some people find difficult to accept. So let us rewind the clock and find out just what set this brilliant mind ticking. Despite being born into a wealthy, high-achieving family, Darwin was somewhat unconventional. As a child, he was obsessed with collecting all manner of bizarre objects. He certainly couldn't be bothered with school. To me, school was simply a blank. He far preferred conducting chemical experiments in the garden shed. His father wanted him to become a doctor, but alas, Darwin couldn't stand the sight of blood. And after studying medicine at Edinburgh University, he left with no qualifications whatsoever. He then went to Cambridge, where he spent time drinking and dining with the Glutton Club, a society dedicated to stuffing themselves with birds and beasts unknown to the human palate. They even ate an owl. Is that wise? Whilst here in Cambridge, Darwin again ignored his studies. Nevertheless, he did discover a fascination for botany and for natural history. It's said, for instance, that he learned to identify every species of beetle within 10 miles of the university. And it was also here he made one of the decisive contacts of his life. He met the Reverend Stephen Henslow, the man who was to give him the chance to sail on HMS Beetle, a vessel bound for a voyage of exploration across the great South Sea. Getting a job on the Beagle wasn't easy. Captain Fitzroy believed in the Victorian idea of physiognomy and didn't like the shape of Darwin's nose, believing it showed a lack of energy and determination. Nor was Darwin's father impressed with the idea, as there was no salary on offer. Besides, he wanted his son to become a minister. However, Charles's uncle intervened, and so, at the age of 22, he prepared to set sail with a crew of 74 seamen, six boys, a surgeon and his assistant, an artist, an instrument maker and a carpenter, all living together in cramped conditions. Charles Darwin 
had no previous experience of the sea. And imagine the apprehension he must have felt before the voyage. He was clearly very stressed. He also suffered from heart palpitations at the prospect that he may never see his family again. HMS Beadle sailed on the 7th of December, 1831. And it would be five years before she came home again. Leaving Devonport, the ship headed across the Atlantic towards Brazil. Predictably, Darwin found life on board an utter nightmare. Very soon, he became as sick as a dog. He was hammock bound for days. But it was whilst he was in his cabin that he began to read a book which would prove to be a major influence upon him. Charles Lyell. This was Lyell's Principles of Geology. This book, which was radical in its day, argued that the surface of the Earth had gradually changed over long periods of time. Darwin was initially sceptical of this idea, but as he journeyed from island to island, he would soon begin to see evidence that supported this theory. He began to keep a journal of all he saw and started to collect so many different animals that he had to enlist the help of one of the ship's boys to help shoot and stuff them all. In addition to the increasingly foul-smelling store he was accruing in the hold, much to the dismay of his shipmates, he would also post specimens home to his good friend Hensley. Although exactly what these things were, and whether they were arriving safely, Darwin couldn't be sure. Some two months after leaving England, the beagle arrived in Brazil. It was here, in the depths of the Brazilian jungle, that Charles Darwin was overwhelmed with the sheer diversity of life. Like many educated Victorians, Darwin was an avid collector, and Brazil was a collector's paradise. By day he observed, poached and stuffed, while by night he wrote of his adventures. I never experienced such intense delight, he wrote in a letter home. He marveled at the insects of the jungle and noted how many of them used camouflage to avoid predators. Needless to say, he pocketed a few. After bagging 68 different species in just one day, he wrote to his family, I am becoming quite devoted to natural history. In August 1832, amid the wintry landscape of Patagonia, he came upon the fossilized bones of long extinct creatures. Yet he noticed, to his amazement, that these fossils bore striking similarities to creatures still alive at the time. Again, his mind was set whirring. In 1833, the beadle arrived at the Falkland Islands. Here, he puzzled over small plant-like marine animals or corals, and it occurred to him that perhaps there was no real dividing line between animals and plants. Then in March 1835, miles from the sea in the foothills of the Andes, he stumbled upon layers of seashells trapped in the rock strata and even parts of an ancient petrified forest. He recalled Lyell's theories of geological change, which suggested the world had changed greatly over millions of years and wondered, had South America once been under the sea? Almost four years after leaving home, Regal stopped at a small group of volcanic islands known as the Galapagos. Here, 600 miles from the west coast of Ecuador, life had developed independently of the mainland. And it was this chance visit that would eventually ensure Charles Darwin's place in history. <laughs>